You're watching Tech Shark, bite-sized news for free thinkers surfing the net. Today, I have the honor of being joined by the British historian Tom Rousel, host of the Survive the Jive channel, named for defying the loss of history amid a technological age. Thanks for joining us on Tech Shark. Thanks very much for having me, Alex. So, from what I can tell, Survive the Jive's videos range from folklore of the English countryside to the armor and DNA of Vikings, and even traveling to Bali to learn about Balinese Hinduism. Can you tell us a bit about your channel on YouTube and your academic background on the ancient religions of Europe? Well, that's a pretty fair assessment of the channel. It does have quite uh, diverse content, but there is actually a, a unifying theme in all those diverse, diverse things. I studied uh, my MA in medieval history, focusing on the religious practices of the Anglo-Saxons and Vikings before they converted to Christianity. So uh, my interest in that kind of paganism was uh, a focus of the channel at an early stage, but later it began to uh, expand into related forms of religious traditions in um, what's known by linguists and uh, scholars of comparative religion as Indo-European cultures. Um, and gradually, since 2015, since the uh, since what's known as the, gen the genomic revolution, uh, with major advances in the science of population genetics and archaeogenetics, looking at the DNA of skeletons of people long dead, we, we now can answer questions that archaeologists and historians have argued over for hundreds of years quite easily. And uh, the questions regarding the Indo-Europeans, which were defined originally just by language and also by shared mythology and religious practices previously, and people wondered whether they had actually ever been a single people with a, you know, a single genetic uh, source from which, uh, which spread with the languages. The question has been answered, and the answer is yes. And uh, these uh, new findings have also been covered on my channel, uh, as well as folkloric practices in the British Isles and abroad, which derive from, the, uh, from ancient pagan Indo-European traditions, uh, a look at ancient texts, archaeological findings, so uh, all of it seems quite uh, disparate and diffuse, but it's actually very focused on a, a very fascinating topic, which is what enormous influence these uh, people who lived in the late Neolithic have had on cultures all over the world to the extent that we're now speaking in a language which uh, derives directly from the one that they spoke. Absolutely. And it seems that Facebook decided to purge you and your wife with zero warning. I mean, your work is barely political. I mean, if anything, I think you have addressed how the media has politicized scientific research as a political tool to be skewed for various agendas. I saw nothing problematic among your channel. Can you tell me a bit about how Facebook took action against your page and why you think it occurred? Um, it happened on Thursday, the 22nd of July. I only realized my I couldn't access my Facebook uh, profile and my wife said the same thing and then I uh, when I realized my profile had been deleted um, then I checked the pages for my for Survive the Jive which is the YouTube channel we've already mentioned but also for a film which I made in 2014 called From Ruins to Ruins which was not originally on YouTube but has subsequently been added to YouTube but uh it's uh, that had its own page with almost as many followers, about uh, 15,000 or so, as the Survive the Jive page. And bo both of them were removed. The From Ruins to Ruins page only posted content relating to Anglo Saxons, archaeology, literature, etc. And the um, Survive the Jive page posted more widely about different things to do with pagan religions, archaeology, history. Um, but neither of them were political, except when I made comments on, as you say, the politicization of archaeology and history by what I perceive to be, and many agree, including people in academia, a left-wing bias in Western academia. Um, such, I've made a lot of public comments on that, and I've done streams on it, such that I have made enemies in the world of academia. Certain prominent figures have, uh, on the, in the, the you know, blue check marks on Twitter have uh, cursed my name. Uh, but I haven't actually done anything wrong, despite upsetting them. Uh, all I've done is call them out for, 
things they've done. For example, a year or two ago, there was a concerted effort by a group of extreme left academics to ban the word Anglo-Saxon, um, or at least have it completely removed from academic discourse. And this began in America, but quickly spread to Europe. And it was argued originally on the basis that it had it was a racist term in America. Uh, uh, then it spread to Europe, even though even if we took their argument as fact, which I don't, uh, that usage wasn't in, what doesn't apply to Europe. So but they still try to have it banned across academia. And I was the first to blow the whistle on this and say how awful it was. And subsequently, a whole load of prominent academics uh, in history and uh, archaeology signed a document opposing them. And so they fa their, their little effort failed. And uh, I don't know if they blame me for for rallying up support against it. I don't know if those people would have written all their signatures on that petition anyway, if I hadn't have done that stream. But uh, I certainly ro uh, raised a lot of awareness of it. And I do things like that, which could be construed as political. Uh, but generally, the channel isn't political. Yeah, you know, I've noticed that medieval history, like everything else, is under siege, especially that of the British Isles, probably because it's so important. Late Supreme Court Justice Scalia had this great bit where he recalled how he at first resented how French-speaking academics referred to America, Australia, Canada, and so on as, quote, Anglo-Saxon countries, or Anglosphere, as many call it, but said that when he went to the UK for himself, he, even as Italian diaspora, felt at home in the land of Shakespeare and nursery rhymes. Hey, my name is Scalia, and I'm as American as anybody. Look at this face. Is this an Anglo-Saxon face? I had never been in England, but at the end of my year, I went to England, and I felt at home. There is, there is no doubt that American culture, American common culture, which nobody has to belong to, originates with English culture. The British Isles are really the core of America's kind of founding culture. Why do you think big tech companies in particular, like Facebook, are now flagging something like that, the celebration of that culture as so controversial? Why would big tech target it? Well, firstly, I should say that I haven't specifically had any messages from big, t uh, big tech companies uh, flagging any of my videos that deal with medieval history. So I can't be certain that that is the reason why my Facebook profile was deleted and my pages were deleted. They haven't told me the reason. But uh, I, I can imagine that, that, that the, in, a, in the context of America, the reason that they would uh, dislike uh, notions of identity among white Americans that put, pertain to, or, or even non-white Americans, but any kind of identity that pertains specifically to uh, pre-American uh, ethnic identities in Europe relating to medieval peoples and older peoples is that it contradicts uh, a new uh, notion of identity and belonging that they want to promote in America and beyond, which doesn't have any room for those kind of identities within it. Tom Thomas Jefferson uh, obviously spoke Old English, Anglo-Saxon, uh, wow. uh, which I also studied uh, at my uh, university. And he said, you know, that the Anglo-Saxon law and culture was an enormous part of what it is to be an American, which is why he w wanted the seal of the United States to include the uh, Anglo-Saxon chieftains, the legend, the semi-mythical progenitors, uh, Hengist and Horsa on that seal. And th that wasn't the one they went for in the end. But the fact that it was even considered shows how important these old English Anglo-Saxon identities were to the founding fathers of the United States. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd argue that beyond that, many Americans have grown up with films about British pirates who raided and settled on our East Coast, such as Blackbeard, who died in North Carolina, or enjoyed British fantasies such as Lord of the Rings or Warhammer. Clearly, culture matters, and the gateways that distribute it matter. Would you argue that social media, in this era of history YouTubers and sea shanty TikToks, is the last means we have to pass down this culture? Clearly, there's a market for it. Absolutely. I've said so for a long time. I wrote an article back in 2014 for Medievalist.net, 
which they subsequently deleted after they decided uh, in 2019, I think it was, to, to purge the website of all my contributions, although they'd hosted them for years without any problem. But I said in that uh, article, which was titled uh, Why the Barbarians Aren't Going Away, that th the popularity of uh, these popular cultural uh, texts, uh, phenomena like Marvel, Thor, Game of Thrones, the Viking series on the History Channel, and all the subsequent things, Netflix's Barbarian series, are uh, due to the fact that people aren't entirely satisfied with a rootless sense of uh, collective identity, which is you know, the, the main one that's promoted in, in the modern world. And they want to feel a sense of belonging. They want to feel a sense of being rooted in time and space with uh, a connection to those who have gone before. And the nation states of Europe were always conscious of their, the roots of the, their roots in the migration era and the movements of people in that time, like the Anglo-Saxons. And so obviously these have, you know, carried on into the modern era and new the, the industrial revolution was one way of sort of breaking people up and taking them off the land. And that created a sense of of uh, rootlessness that had a reaction uh, where people tried to revive it in romantic ways in the, in the Victorian era. And now the, the next technological revolution of social media and Internet and everything has once again made people feel even more divorced from their roots, from from nature and from everything. So they're looking for ways to connect with the with the land, with their ancestors, thing with their history, things like that. And so they'll do it for, through video games and through films or whatever you know popular cultural products are available. But I, I hope also a lot. I'm happy to say a lot of them also are doing it through my channel and through other history channels where they're learning solid historical facts and teaching them about who they really are. Absolutely. And it has been fascinating to watch a sort of contrast between how things Amer work in America versus Europe. I mean, I've been watching how in mainland Europe in particular, even supposedly socialist countries have been passing laws to conserve their cultures, whether in Denmark or France or whatever, laws that Americans would find shocking from supposedly PC Europe. But America, Canada, the UK, often seem to be ground zero for big tech censorship, for political correctness, and surveillance more so than mainland Europe. Why is it that countries descending from the British Empire have this Achilles heel that makes them go 1984 or censor their own culture, while mainland, while mainland Europe, even the French, seem far more willing to defend it? What's going on there? Oh, that's a difficult question. I suppose you could draw a distinction between the what you could people call Anglo-Saxon forms of law, basically British forms of law, English law and common law, uh, which weren't as influenced by N Napoleonic reforms uh, that, that swept across the continent in various ways, um, such that the state has a different kind of role traditionally in, in the Anglosphere, which is what well, traditionally I think it's meant to play a, a softer role than it does on the continent, uh, but things have changed. And I, I don't think that's the case anymore, where in Britain and America and Canada, you can say that the state is, is a softer and more benign presence. But um, I certainly, that used to be a distinction people were able to make anyway. Absolutely. I mean, I've noticed also, to your point earlier, people tend to love history in times of crisis because it gives them something to hold on to amid chaos. The movie The Dig on Netflix, which I really loved, on the surface was about the Sutton Hoo excavation of that Anglo-Saxon warlord on his boat. But on a deeper level, it was about how history gives us a place in the world's story. How does the big tech global corporate establishment benefit from people who lack a sense of place in the world beyond what they consume or what they're offended by? Well, it doesn't. It, it, I think... Uh... That, that's why I was surprised. I quite enjoyed The Dig. There were some great lines from Ray Fiennes' character in it, where he talked about this sort of, you know, and his wife as well, talking about their pride of coming from Staffordshire and being from that land and connecting to it through archaeology. 
And that's often been what history and archaeology has been about. Even in ancient times, you know, they were interested in ancient, even more ancient monuments and ancient artifacts because they felt a sense of belonging to it. Here in England, the Anglo-Saxons buried themselves sometimes in Bronze Age barrows, which were thousands of years older than them. They get buried their dead there to try and connect them. And Viking burials have been found with Stone Age axes in them. So, you know, thousands of years old axe. It would be the equivalent of you or I being buried with a Viking era axe or something even older, in fact. So this idea of wanting to be rooted is not a, just a modern phenomenon, like I described, a reaction against the modern world. It's actually something perennially human and natural. But it does create an obstacle for those who want to redefine humanity in a way that it no longer lives in continuity with the past. It no longer has these ties to land and to place and to people and to cultures. Uh, anyone who wanted to try and encourage a new way of being for mankind would obviously see such things as obstacles that need to be destroyed. Absolutely. And for those of us who are either making content or defending the right of people to make content, we've definitely got our work cut out for us. So we're about out of time, but it's been an honor speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me and uh, giving me opportunity to to say what's happened to me regarding Facebook. You've been watching TechShark. Once again, I'm Alexander Hall with MRC-TV and Free Speech America. Have a good week.